no que diz respeito a, às regras de participação. Portanto, a sessão irá ser gravada para que posteriormente uh, possam consultar uh, a gravação da sessão que irá ficar disponível na página do, do evento. Os microfones por defeito estão desligados. No entanto, uh, se quiserem participar na sessão, colocando questões aos oradores, poderão fazê-lo utilizando o chat, levantando a mão, pedindo para falar e podem então ligar o vosso microfone e colocar as questões diretamente. Quanto às, uh, aos slides, uh, eles também irão ser disponibilizados na página do evento, por isso durante o dia de hoje e a da manhã uh, nós iremos adicionar uh, as apresentações e caso queiram colaborar na partilha de destaques e de informações que vão sendo aqui partilhadas durante a sessão, poderão fazê-lo nas redes sociais utilizando a hashtag do Opener, Opener underscore EU. Portanto, a sessão de hoje vai ser de, dedicada, tal como o nome indica, à, pra, às práticas de gestão e abertura de dados, onde se vão falar de ferramentas, planos de gestão de dados, da esfera e gestão de custos, uh, onde, onde iremos contar com a participação da Eli Papadopoulos, uh, que vai falar do serviço Argos para a criação de planos de, planos de gestão de dados. De seguida, Teremos Daniel, que irá falar de, dos planos de dados no Horizonte 2020, falar aqui um pouco da, da experiência que teve no estudo que realizou junto de, de beneficiários que, que, que realizaram planos de dados. De seguida, iremos ter Ryan O'Connor, que vai falar da, da, da gestão de custos uh, na gestão dos dados de investigação. Teremos também Natália Botica, que vai falar das diretrizes Partenos, para a aplicação dos princípios FAIR à gestão dos dados. E, por fim, Paula Moura, que, que, vai, que vai aqui, que nos vai trazer uh, alguns exemplos de serviços do Open Air que auxiliam os investigadores uh, na gestão dos dados de, de investigação. Entretanto, sim, penso que já poderemos dar início, nós já temos mais de 100 participantes. Sim, yes. already over. 100, so let's start. <laughs> so, Ali, you can, I, I, I will stop my, my sharing screen, so you can start. Hello? Yes. I yes, think now we, yes, thank you. All right. Uh, so, hello, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Pedro, André, Paula, for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, invited uh, to, and to, to see your community, to to be welcomed in your community. Thank you very much. So I'm El Bodopoulou. I work for Athena Research and Innovation Center, and I manage uh, parts of the of Argos uh, service, which is about data management planning. And as you can see, I'm not, this avatar is not me. It's just something to put a smile on our faces when we hear research data management. Uh, hopefully this will do the trick. Uh, all right, so let's start. This will be the, uh, the overview of my presentation. I will start very briefly um, saying a few things about DMPs, so what they are uh, and what is their, uh, the importance around it. I will then uh, move on to introducing the Argo service, what are the key features that you will find and what are the enhancements that we get from being integrated within the Opener ecosystem. Uh, I will then uh, explain how different stakeholders can use Argos and what are the benefits, and we'll see some next steps. So about data management, uh, and actually about data management and research data uh, management. Um, we see here, this is a table explaining uh, differences between these three main concepts, repeatability, replicability, and reproducibility. Reproducibility is one of the goals of uh, research data management uh, and open science in general, uh, so that research is, uh, share, is shared, of course, and can be reproduced uh, by others. You can see here uh, some, uh, they are similar concepts, but uh, they look similar, uh, but they have in detail, if you go into detail, you will see that they actually uh, differ in a few points. And I would urge you to actually have a look at this uh, very interesting paper uh, that was produced by ACM. And so we want research to be reproducible, repeatable and replicable, but also we need uh, open and fair research data. 
and uh, we see that there are uh, the open access uh, principles, the fair principles uh, that have been around for, for years now, and we see that they are uh, embedded in the research sector, uh, like the like funders now, apart from the European Commission, more funders uh, are uh, applying those uh, principles and pro produce policies and best practices for researchers to follow. Also in academia, they are uh, included in academia for uh, more and more institutions have uh, like encouraged that um, the, research, the, the management of research data and the production of DMPs for their uh, postgraduates, the, their PhD students. And also we see all that uh, open and fair uh, are core in the development of the European Open Science Cloud or EOSC in short. But we, at the end, we don't just want the data to be open and fair, but we want the uh, research objects to be fair, and that goes uh, far beyond the, the data. But uh, here we talk about the workflows, we talk about the code and other uh, outputs and activities included in the research data management life. All right, so let's see. Uh, where do the DMPs uh, stand in the research data management lifecycle? Here we see that they, they are in the planning phase. So during the, this is the first step of a research data management lifecycle. It's uh, what we do um, when we uh, plan our activities for, it, uh, for how to handle data, how to, where to preserve data and so on. And it's very important to do so because uh, it's important to plan activities, data activities prior to uh, starting the project or the research, uh, con the research um, that we want to undertake because uh, that minimizes uh, actually the costs which you will see later uh, in the presentation by Ryan. Um, but what is the DMP? It's actually a, a document uh, similar. You can see here I added an image. Uh, it's it, it's like viewing a document, a Word document, but uh, we'll see how Argos adds things and uh, maximizes its uh, its benefits also in the machine uh, actionable um, machine actionable benefits. Um, so yes, it's a document and I, it's a deliverable and living document because someone can uh, go in, uh, edit it at any time in the research process and according to how data have evolved throughout the activities or if new data have been produced, they can uh, go through and make modifications uh, and, keep, uh, preserve, and keep the provenance uh, and the tracking of how the data have evolved throughout time. What it's not, and this is very important to know, it's not a research assessment method. Um, the value of the DMPs uh, is uh, exactly here, as I state a few of, uh, of things. Uh, like having DMPs helps us understand how we can reuse other people's, uh, other researchers' data and how we can further exploit uh, those data. And if we can do it, uh, because some, um, uh, data might not be openly shared, uh, how we can increase the quality of our research by having DMPs, um, how our data can be more, uh, can, their fundability can be increased, they are available to, to people, to more people. Uh, by having DMPs, we also, uh, and by, um, by um, um, Yes, by having DMPs, we can understand also if we are, uh, for example, more administrative uh, or other stakeholders like institutions or funders, we can understand the strengths and weaknesses uh, that particular areas uh, have so that we know where to fund more, for example, which areas to fund more. Plus, we ensure there is integrity and excellence of researchers by doing so. And uh, where, do, uh, where does Argos stand in all of that uh, ecosystem and in, in, in all of that uh, evolution is that Argos uh, tries to incorporate all the open and fair principles. So the outputs produced uh, are themselves open and fair. Plus, uh, the researchers are guided through the very ba the basic concepts uh, and they understand what is uh, research data management when they are writing a data management plan. Um, you can find Argos uh, 
in in that uh, in the in the in opener, but also you can find it's available in the EOSC, and you can uh, configure it in your own institution. You can use the online version um, and uh, also collaborate with other people uh, while working um, with the, while while writing a data management plan, and it's free for researchers to use. So here we see the Argos life cycle. Uh, the Argos uh, follows a full publication life cycle, meaning that you can see start, we start research start from adding, uh, creating the data management plan and adding the very administrative and basic information about the research, like the project that they, uh, that they are creating this DMP for, the grant ID, the authors of this DMP uh, description and so on, the funder and, and, and so on. And then they can add data sets. Um, so they can add as many data sets as, as they want, um, corresponding to how many data sets they will have produced in the project. And uh, this is very, um, this, this is a really flexible, um, let's say, solution that has been applied to Argos. It differentiates and it separates the, the administrative information from the DMP. Uh, so that we target, we see the more targeted information about data sets themselves, and we um, and we can understand which data set has, has been described with which metadata standard is in which repository and so on, so that we don't mix everything under one DMP uh, if we have like, let's say, a huge collection of data sets. Uh, we, we can uh, keep things clear and tidy under each data set description according to the different types of data sets uh, produced or different discipline specific data sets that have been produced in the project. Then uh, we can validate all this information. This is a first set of uh, validation. It means that we just check if the mandatory fields have been uh, completed by the researchers and then you can finalize uh, the DMPs either in Argos and they can stay private or public in Argos for other people to view if, if it's public. And uh, they can also um, proceed to getting a DOI and being published in the general repository of OpenAir, which is in auto, and they can do it immediately from uh, Argos. Having uh, followed all those steps, we see that this is the output uh, that is produced in Argos. It's, um, as you can see, it follows uh, some of the open and fair, um, and fair principles uh, in that uh, it has, it is discoverable through Opener. It is versioned. So uh, we keep the provenance of the different uh, versions uh, of, of the DMPs. It is interoperable. It has a DOI um, uh, as, as, as it is as an output itself. It is reusable uh, because it provides uh, licenses. Um, so people can select the license that they want the DMP to be shared under. And this is very important because um, Daniel will show how, why this is important. Uh, we, we identified a few issues uh, in, the, in the report that he will be showing to you later. And, and all the, all the DMPs are preserved in the Zenodo, of course, which is um, for long-term preservation. Uh, plus, we don't, uh, plus, uh, as I said before, the DMPs are documents, but actually they're not. In Argos, they're not because they have, uh, we have, as you can see here, I don't know if you can see, because I have this bar and that I don't see clear. But we have applied the RDA DMP common standard. So we actually provide more information about a, a DMP rather than a plain uh, publication document would have uh, like data sets. We have lots of information that we capture about data sets that uh, plain uh, publications do not have. And key features, uh, one I already stated, people, uh, you, you can use it and you can add as many data sets as you want, the descriptions of as many data sets as you want uh, and separate per type and per um, discipline uh, area that, you, that these uh, data sets are about. Um, and it's also useful because uh, if you want to reuse a data, sets, a data set and describe it in a different DMP, you can uh, quickly 
drag and take it, copy it, and use it in another DAP that you have created in Argos. Another thing is that we allow for more than one RDM templates to be uh, selected in uh, DMP. And that is, again, useful because uh, let's say that we have the Horizon 2020, for example, which has the basic, tem it's the basic template that uh, we all know. Uh, but we also have the Horizon 2020 template of the Clarin D community uh, that has the same um, as the, as the general uh, fields, as the general template fields, but is tweaked to better represent and better uh, fulfill the needs of the specific community uh, with specific standards, for example, particular repositories and so on. Uh, so people, if, if they're working on an interdisciplinary, let's say, or multidisciplinary project, they can click both and work uh, at its uh, and, and select which one to, to use at any time. Um, plus, we also have uh, make make the completion of DMPs easier by drawing information from the Open Air Research Graph and from EOSC, um, so that people uh, find easier the resources and the answers to their questions. Uh, also, you can collaborate very easy collaborate and uh, share this DMP with your other colleagues and manage workload like this. Uh, you can also, we support interoperability, so you can export the JSON, uh, the, the JSON DMP, DMP in JSON format, and you can uh, upload it in different, in, in another, let's say, RDA compliant tool and seamlessly continue work there, so without, without losing vital information. And uh, this is important and, and very important because let's say, let's, uh, think about how we work with work with Word documents. We may have a, a document, a Word document, and um, work on that on a, on a OneDrive, for example, and then we might download it and upload it on a Google Drive, uh, have a, uh, so it, it's been transported to a Google Doc. But the idea is that we don't lose information. Th this is the same concept behind uh, what we have been uh, doing uh, with the JSON format, so that you can download the DMP from us from any other RDA compatible tool and import, and you don't miss any information while doing it, and you can continue your work uh, uninterrupt uninterrupted. Plus, we provide DOIs and versioning. I've already said that. Uh, let's see why this is important. Uh, you see here uh, the whole ecosystem of Open Air in one uh, slide. Uh, you see here the research graph where we make all the links with uh, different products and different entities of research uh, conduct. You see here Explore, which is our search engine. You see Monitor, which we uh, have indicators that uh, and we try to monitor different stages of, uh, of outputs and different uh, characteristics of the outputs. We have Develop, which you can use to develop services, Provide, which is the, uh, uh, one of the first services and supporting the repository network of Opener is a nodo, which is a generic repository. And this is what we use in, in Argos to, uh, to close the, the DMP lifecycle and publish DMPs in Zenodo. You also see the guidelines that we have produced throughout times uh, within the research data management task force. We, have, we are producing guidelines such as uh, how to license your data, how to select a proper repository, and all this we have also incorporated in the templates of Argos so that it's easier for people to understand how to proceed with specific uh, steps of the DMP. And you see here uh, some of the NOAD, the National Open Access Desks, which have kindly uh, worked on uh, providing their feedback and also translating the Argos in their language so that uh, researchers can, uh, native researchers can, can find it easier. What we are doing particularly with the research graph is work to work with them to uh, separate the DMP and make a new entity only about DMPs in the graph and then create links uh, with the projects that this DMP co corresponds to and the data that this DMP has. Here you can see the same representation, the, the, um, the, the same thing like in the previous, um, like in the previous slide, but you can, um, you can see how they all connect with each other. You can see, for example, that we use the APIs and Noro, 
uh, that when someone submits a, a DMP uh, in, in Argos, now this is ongoing yet in, in the integration, but in, in the in, in few uh, months from now, when they submit a DMP from Argos, then they, and they mention a specific repository that their data will be submitted in a specific repository, then a notification will be sent to the provide um, to the provide uh, service and pro managers, repository managers will get this notification and be prepared that uh, they, they there there is uh, someone that would need uh, support on, on data. Similar to the monitor, we send notifications to the monitor so that we, we keep track of the usage of DMPs, plus we also collaborate with funders to, to create indicators and check uh, how evaluation can be done. And the, all of that is uh, searchable in, in Explore, the search edge engine of OpenAI. So for funders, uh, you can use the online on the, or, the, um, or, or have an installation uh, ad hoc. Uh, these are the benefits. By doing so, you can uh, funders can enrich uh, their the templates collection, meaning that they can add their template in the Argos collection of DMPs. The they can translate it to a native language. They can customize the open and fair guides to uh, correspond to the needs of their policy, and they can link with the funder monitoring dashboard um, and start uh, start uh, making uh, start producing indicators uh, with uh, with respect to that. Um, yes, a few other uh, key key things. If if you try the ad hoc version, then you can have this in your institution. Make all these links in your institution um, and, and have an institutional uh, graph. Let's say. Um, the, the, the funders that we collaborate is Chistera, and uh, recently we had a very productive meeting with uh, FCT, uh, and we are working on uh, having a template uh, in from MC, from DMPs um, that come from FCT in Argos. Uh, where the areas that we work with the Chistera are these policy training, funder monitoring dashboard, and the template for research communities. Uh, it's the same. The research communities can enrich the template uh, with uh, with new uh, with new templates specifically for their discipline. They can customize the guides again specific to their discipline. They can configure uh, their own MPIs from uh, own resources from th that they know um, that are used in the in the area, and integrate their own services and link with the research community dashboards. And we have an example of a. Uh, working with Ariadne Plus community about archaeological data. We worked on landscape, landscaping. We checked to see what are the archaeology uh, templates around uh, in globally and what are the gaps. We tried to do the same for the, the, for the template. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I will try to speak quicker. Uh, and we also integrate uh, global standards like the RDA, so people, uh, researchers that uh, use our template, our, the Ariadne Plus in Argos, they can, um, they can have a machine actionable DMP. For researchers, they can use it, it's free, uh, they can be, get guided through open Ferris's data management and familiar, familiarize themselves with the DMP process. They can choose the templates they want, they can edit them, they can share, they can create new version and publish uh, in the nodo. This is how it looks like, uh, and this is how uh, people in research and, acad and academia uh, can use it. This is um, um, a record, the DMP record in the opener, you can see, in Argos, sorry, you can see that this is a DMP, it has one data set, uh, what, who are the authors, etc. If you publish it, you get a DOI, and it's always accessible from, from this page, from the DMP record page. You can finalize it, and this is how uh, a data set description looks like. You see here, th these are all the steps included in the template uh, and so on. Uh, you, you can just complete it quickly. And uh, this is the home page where you can see it's been, it's been translated uh, in uh, many languages now. Uh, and this is the customization in Portuguese, how it looks like in uh, the Argos looks like in Portuguese. Um, how uh, people can select the, um, uh, the funder, the different grant ID, how they can 
And this is very primary. And uh, this, this is the template that we have started creating uh, in, in Argos uh, from FCT. And uh, that you will be, uh, that, you, that you can use later in the year. Um, and this is how it looks like uh, who, who has um, worked on that, what, what is the grant, etc. Thank you very much to uh, FCT and University of Minho who translated this, uh, this uh, Argos and provided us with the templates. Uh, next steps, the latest achievements would say that we always try to collaborate with the global community of uh, RDM through RDA and other fora and we had a hackathon uh, where, where we could express uh, and give input to what, what's been happening uh, from our side. And also, we, if you want to check more about uh, how linked open data and DMPs uh, uh, can, can, can be uh, included in linked open data, then you can uh, check this, this paper that we submitted and presented in the International Semantic Web Conference. And this is what's coming very soon, the administrator is where uh, your own as administrators create your own um, your own template just for resources and thank you very much thank you Ali and thanks for, for your presentation it's now time to to answer some questions from the audience if someone wants to to make some questions to Ali please write it in the chat or open your microphone there are some things, but I don't know if I can. Yes, there is a question that I have already replied quickly, but maybe ah, Ali, you okay. can add something important is that uh, um, Maria Maria Barbosa is asking if um, if the service is free to use by researchers and how to yes. proceed to in fact use it. You just can reply. Go to the, yes, just go to, to argus.opener.eu. Is this what you also replied? Yes, yes. See the link, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if you have any questions, you know where to find us. Has <laughs> anyone uh, any question additional? What is, thank you, is it cool for an institution have a no DMP of affiliated researchers? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand, sorry. Uh, affiliated researchers of what? Of, of within the DMP, you mean? I suppose that is if 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 um, if um, people can track the the DMPs from researchers from a specific organization. Um, yes. For example, Emilia have responsibilities in in a university, a particular university in Portugal is the University of Algarve. If he can, if if a researcher can acknowledge the, can explicitly say mention the institution and. Uh, yes, it's yes, possible to. Track they they can acknowledge it. Yes, yes, we we can track it. Yes. Okay. okay. This, Thank you very much. This can I ask questions? Yes, I, I, just, I just have one 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 question, Andre. If I okay. if I may, just maybe because of this question, also maybe Ali can elaborate a little bit uh, uh, more about the. Um, the links to to different kinds of PIDs, for example, or kids and these things, just to to clearly elabor elaborate that Argus is connected with different kinds of persistent identifiers, including the, the resources. Yes, the so authors, including the authors. Exactly. So they can immediately. We have integrated uh, different resources that uh, also are um, are aggregated from from Opener. And one of them is ORCID, and we use it only for the individual researchers to identify individual researchers that are working on the DMP, but also that are working with research data. Uh, and you can add them uh, by adding either their name, and then the ORCID will appear, or by just searching immediately for, for, the, for the ORCID if you know it already. And it's very important because uh, then when it's published, uh, it also it redirects to the, you know, core and, uh, and all the other um, harvesters that uh, are trying to do also the mapping and send back information to Opener so that um, affiliations can be, can be visible. Okay. I think we have another question from uh, Natalia. Please, Natalia. 
Uh, hello, Ellie. Uh, I want to ask you a question because I have some data sets of archaeology that I'm going to share in Ardiaven infrastructures. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I don't understand if uh, I can put my data sets in um, Argos. Uh, the, the degradation to the Ariadne is uh, automatic or, or not? In Argos, you don't put the data sets, you describe the data set. When you oh. have data sets, you, you just describe uh, the data set according to open and fair principles and, and the template that's been given to you. Uh, first is that, and second is that we have a work with Ariadne Plus. So I know that you have a, a, a tool that has a template of Ariadne Plus um, uh, for, for archaeological data. We work with them to just transport everything in our tool and make it machine actionable. So you can actually use whichever one you 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 like, either the Ariadne Plus or the Argos, uh, which has collaborated with, with Ariadne Plus. It, it okay. doesn't matter if it's just to use. It doesn't matter. It's up to you which environment you feel more comfortable using and familiar with. You are familiar. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we, we don't have more questions. Thank you, Ellie, again. You. If you want to stay with us, I'll stay. you can stay. And uh, if another uh, another one wants to, to make some additional questions in the chat, please do. And Ellie uh, will we'll see the, the question and, and answer. Ok, muito bem. Portanto, de seguida, uh, teremos então uh, Daniel Spitzstinger. Uh, que é Research Policy Specialist and Open Science Expert e vai-nos falar uh, dos planos de gestão de dados no Horizonte 2020, uh, nomeadamente o que pensam os beneficiários uh, e o que, o que podemos aprender com, com a sua experiência. Uh, good afternoon, um, uh, Daniel. So, you can start your presentation. You can, we can see you already. Okay, great. So thanks for the for the invitation. Um, glad to be here. So it's a very topical uh, presentation because I just finished uh, this this work. I have a little bit of background noise, uh, but okay, I think it's okay now. So uh, yeah, I was working as uh, some of you know uh, for uh, six years in the Commission on Open Access and Open Data. And uh, since 2018, I'm back in Vienna, uh, working partially self-employed and partially uh, employed. So for this project, uh, I was employed by the University of Vienna uh, in, as part of uh, Open Air Advance. So it was a little sub-project, a little uh, sub-study, so to speak. Um, I think you know, it fits very well with the previous presentation, so I will not uh, say anything about what DMPs are, except as many of you know, um, for those that participated in Open Research Data in Horizon 2020, it's an obligation to do a DMP if there was uh, no opt-out. Um, so what we wanted in this project, you know, I wanted to do this for quite a while to actually look a bit more into DMPs and to see uh, what are good practices, but also what are challenges, what maybe are also mistakes uh, in DMPs across different disciplines. Um, so what actually we did in the project, it, uh, it evolved over time is um, we, we had a qualitative and a quantitative part of the project. The qualitative part, this is how we started the project, was we said, okay, let's have a look at a limited number of DMPs. Uh, we decided on six um, and do a qualitative analysis of these DMPs, which we did through a modified uh, rubric. So we used uh, a rubric, uh, not the new one by Science Europe, but uh, already existed one from the University of Kent. Um, and we also had interviews uh, about 30 minutes each with uh, six uh, case studies um, from uh, social sciences and humanities, two, two from physical sciences and engineering, and two from life sciences. Um, 
And then we also were uh, added as a way because we found quite a lot of DMPs through CODIS, which initially we didn't know. Uh, we added a quantitative part, and this quantitative part has two components to it. One of them is uh, we decided to do a curated um, um, collection of uh, those data management plans from Horizon 2020 projects that were available from CODIS, but we had a screening. So, you know, if you download data from CODIS, uh, we, we, we had a look whether um, this was actually really a DMP or some other document and whether this was actually really a public document. So there were some uh, wrongly classified documents in the data from CODIS. And we also uh, looked at whether, and this was the second part now was automated, whether these DMPs uh, are actually copyright. So if they are copyright, you know, there's not much we can do with them. So maybe this is also what Ellie referred to earlier. Um, but if those DMPs that were public, uh, really DMPs, and those were not copyright, those we put in a, a collection on the repository from the University of Vienna, which is called FEDRA. Um, so you can have the link here. And if we have some time afterwards, we could even have a quick look at them. So there are 840 DMPs now, which are uh, on this uh, collection, on this whitelist. Um, but we also have to say, we did not look at the content. Yeah? So we only always looked at these formal criteria. So we do not say these are 840 excellent DMPs. We just say these are 840 DMPs and they are available you know, if you want to have a look uh, how they look like, uh, what has been done in Horizon. Uh, there's also a description about this uh, process on the OpenAir blog. But what we also did, and this will be the primary focus of my presentation, is we also had a survey of the DMP experiences from Horizon 2020 project. So what we did is we wrote to those people that were um, given as uh, contact people in these 840 DMPs, and we asked them to fill out this survey, where we got 108 responses, so 108 projects. 87 gave the acronym uh, 21 Anonymous, uh, but that doesn't mean all of the questions were asked um, by, uh, answered by 108 respondents, um, because questions could be skipped. Uh, from these projects, 63% uh, were still ongoing and 37 percent were completed. Uh, and in the qualitative uh, interviews that we did, it was more the other way around. Most projects in the qualitative interviews were completed and the minority was still ongoing. So what were the results? And here I put together the results from the survey and the interviews because we used the interview guide to do the survey. So the questions are very similar. But in the interviews, we could, of course, go a lot more into detail than we could in the survey. Uh, and uh, it's not exactly how we asked the question, but I grouped um, the results according to themes. The impact of the horizon mandate, the horizon requirement, um, the relation to project management. So I also do a little bit of project development, project management. That's what, why this was also of interest to me. The support. Um, and the availability and curation of data management plans. So the mandate, um, the requirement. Uh, we found out, so we asked, you know, did you know about data management plans before your Horizon 2020 project started? And 54% uh, said yes. What's the word? 54% said yes, but also 45% said no. So for quite a number of projects, in fact, Horizon 2020 was the first time they had it, the requirement has increased uh, the spread of data management plans because you know if this was not a requirement, maybe they wouldn't have done it. Um, also, we found, and this is more from the qualitative interviews, that the knowledge really increased over time. So a lot of people told us when I started, you know, now if I would do the same now, I would do it differently um, because I learned a lot since the time of my project. And, uh, you know, also when I was still in the commission, I had a bit the feeling that people were saying, well, you know, it's another requirement, another bureaucratic uh, exercise that we have to do. So I found it was quite surprising that we also asked, uh, this is here, you know, do you actually consider the data management plan useful 
if you, you know, if it was beyond it being a requirement from the side of the European Commission. And 53% uh, said yes, but another 29% said partially. So uh, about 82% feel it's uh, fully or partially useful and only 18% uh, didn't feel it was useful. And that also leads me, you know, to the conclusion that uh, the, the policy authorized in 2020, uh, the requirement had quite an impact. Um, for the project management part, uh, so if, of course, we do an EU project, many of you will know this, you have different work packages. So I was curious where, um, where in which work package would people put uh, creating, updating a data management plan? Um, and uh, this was the majority uh, put it in the um, work package on management, followed by dissemination, but with quite, uh, with quite uh, some distance between the two. Um, also in the qualitative interviews, uh, you know, there was kind of an indication that this seems to become a little bit the norm of having the DMP in the work package on data management. Um, certainly for those projects which don't have data science as their focus. So there were also 18% which said, we actually have our own work package for data management. Um, this wasn't really in the, in the qualitative interviews. Um, I didn't really see this. So that was more in the quantitative survey. Oops. Um, we also felt for project management, uh, it was what some of the interviewees told us in the qualitative interviews, that could be a good practice to really have one person among each partner organization responsible for data issues, and also for the data management plan. Um, but then additionally, also to have somebody who's responsible for the DMP as a whole, because otherwise you just have people throwing in stuff in the data management plan from their partner. And you know, then there is no really uh, holistic organic uh, structure to the DMP. Uh, for most respondents, it was neither very difficult nor very easy to interact with the other project partners on the DMP. So we, we gave them the answer, you know, from the scale of one to 10, one very easy, 10 very difficult. We see most of the answers clustered around five to eight. So certainly not uh, easy, but also not extremely difficult. Uh, in the qualitative interviews, we asked a little bit more, what were the challenges you encountered? So personal data was a challenge, um, especially once the GDPR came into force, then, you know, people also had to modify their DMPs to account for the GDPR. The amount of time and resources was a challenge. The coordination among geographically distant partners, although this is, of course, an issue not only limited to data management plans, because it also applies to the rest of Horizon projects and the type of data. So one interview said it was easier to get feedback for some types of data than for others. And uh, also not to take too long, there are also some good practices here that were reported, or maybe some, some, some examples from the different projects. What was also important were the templates. So 40%, uh, we asked, did you use a template when creating the data management plan? 40% said, we used template from the Commission or the European Research Council, although bearing in mind, uh, this template is not obligatory to use at least at the moment. 17% said we used another template, but also 25% said actually we didn't use any template. So those were people who made their own template, their own data management plan. Um, there was a bit different opinions on how useful these templates are. Um, many people said yes, some said no, uh, but also many said uh, we would actually like, you know, not just one template for any DMP, but rather to have a bit more tailor-made approach. Um, and this could be done, for example, by an EC approved data management tool. So now that I have heard about Argos, uh, Argos might actually be uh, very useful in this regard. So maybe this should be sort of approved from the Commission as a tool for data management. Um, support, where did people get support from, from doing the data management plan? 
most help from other partners in the project. Uh, actually, then second most, it was actually we didn't get any support. So uh, certainly in the qualitative interviews uh, for the earlier projects, they said, you know, we had to learn all of this ourselves. Um, we maybe had some contacts in the community, uh, but we didn't really get any structured support. And then there are also uh, open air was mentioned a couple of times, certainly also in the qualitative interviews. Um, there was also the library mentioned once it was mentioned also a data archive in the qualitative interviews. Um, I also, you know, we're also curious um, because the DMP is of course in Horizon um, a uh, an obligatory deliver. So it has to be submitted uh, to the commission or the agency. Uh, so um, REA, ERCA, those, those kind of agencies. Um, and I was wondering whether people actually got feedback from the commission or the agency. Uh, the majority did not, 55%. Uh, the rest was uh, evenly split between feedback from the reviewer and from the project officer. Uh, also looking at the comments, uh, those people that received feedback found it was quite useful for their work. But the majority did not get feedback from the commission or the agency. Um, so I certainly had a bit of a feeling that, uh, especially beginners, people who don't know about data management, uh, so this was prominent in the qualitative interviews, they felt a bit lost. And uh, especially before the template was available, they had to do a lot of self-learning. Um, so a number of interviews at different parts in the survey or the interviews also asked for a contact at the European Commission uh, to contact for help, so a designated contact point. And uh, that got me thinking a little bit that um, we already have in Horizon the IP help desk, whether there could not be uh, some sort of data management help desk, which the commission could provide through a public procurement procedure or a so-called grant to a named beneficiary. And of course, I would think that uh, open air would be in an excellent position to provide such uh, services which it already does to a certain extent, but it kind of doesn't have the official stamp as the IP help desk. Um, and then last but not least, the uh, results uh, regarding the availability and curation of DMPs. So in the qualitative interviews, when I asked, uh, are the DMPs actually available? Uh, most people didn't know. So that was funny, in nearly all the interviews they said, oh, I have to check that. And then uh, after checking, they said, yes, we have them on our project website. Now, the problem is, of course, once the project is finished, a lot of these project websites don't exist anymore. And then you don't have the DMP. So uh, when we look at the quantitative survey, in fact, most people said, actually, we don't publish our DMP at all. Followed by, we put it on the website and only 22% put it in a repository. But of course, that should be the good practice. So I would say it's good to have those DMPs that are public on CODIS, but it also would be good if there was a bit more awareness um, that actually DMPs should also be deposited in certified repositories to ensure their preservation after the project is over. So uh, that was a very quick summary. Uh, I had a lot of more slides, but you know, also given the time, I don't want to uh, take too much. This is just a summary uh, of what I've said, just the main takeaways. Uh, I, I think I will uh, not repeat them, uh, but uh, just want everything on one slide. Uh, what are the next steps? So I will put, and uh, this was just done today, I will also put the material, uh, so my analysis of the DMPs, uh, the survey results, um, a bit of a more in-depth uh, PowerPoint with the survey results on the FEDRA repository. We also are planning a publication in Open Research Europe, which I think was presented yesterday. So I haven't submitted that, but uh, I need to do that this week. And we are also going to present very briefly at the Conference of European uh, Project Research Managers. So this is not really the data community, but the project management community, the EU project management community. 
And I was also thinking, but I still need to contact them. Uh, maybe the REA data task force uh, could be interested in that. Um, I see there are uh, some questions in the chat. So uh, just let me finish to say that um, it would also be interested, but at the moment there is no funding since OpenAI Advance also finishes. Um, I, I said in the beginning that when we did our collection, we moved automatically all these DMPs that contain copyright. Um, but that would still be interesting to look into that a bit more, diff, uh, more, more specifically, what were the IP provisions for those DMPs? And we also didn't publish the ERC DMPs because the ERC doesn't have deliverables. And hence, in most ERC DMPs, it is not stated whether these are public documents or not, because you need to state that for DMPs, uh, for deliverables. So uh, that's it from my side. Uh, there's also my personal contact info since my address at the University of Vienna might stop functioning after um, my contract, which is tied to open air finishes, which is at the end of the month. But I'm always happy to uh, answer questions. So let me just stop the presentation so that I can actually see what it says in the chat. And if, um, and then, and thanks, Daniel. We, we, yes. We, we have uh, one question from Caroline. Yeah. Sure. In each moment of the project cycle, did most respondents uh, do their, uh, do their uh, DMP? In, in, you mean maybe at what time of the project cycle? Yes. So, so okay. So, um, of course, there is the requirement that the first version of the DMP, that's the EU requirement, has to be done within the first six months of the project. Uh, but what we also looked at, so this is certainly, yeah, we can say that within the first six months, they have to do a first version, but then this version, of course, should also be updated. Um, so what we did for the, um, for the qualitative interviews, we, and this was part of the selection criteria, I didn't put it on the slide, um, was that the project that we did the qualitative interviews with, they had to have more than one DMP. Um, so what we did is we looked at how also did these DMPs evolve over time. Um, and uh, in five out of the six, uh, they didn't evolve much. So, you know, they basically did one at the beginning and then they just added a few data sets but the structure of the DMP did not really change dramatically. There was one case where it did change. So there really we saw a very nice involvement from a DMP, which at the beginning was quite rudimentary to a DMP, which at the end was much more uh, sophisticated, I would say, which then also included the GDPR relevant, which was not there in the beginning because GDPR was not yet in force. So, um, we cannot really say exactly when they did it, uh, except for that the first version was done within the first six months. And then the project updated them uh, during their life cycle, um, at least those projects which we selected for the qualitative interviews. Okay, thank you. For now, we, 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 have, we... A, I have a question, if I may. Okay. Sure. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, many thanks, Daniel. I think this is uh, this is a, a great work that you you did, and I think it's quite useful for 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 the commission, but also for funders, um, national funders that are putting in place also some uh, kind of of rules to from requirements related with DMPs in their RDM policies. So the the, the question is is about lessons learned that you in in your opinion we should take to national funders that uh, like. For, for us in Portugal, that uh, we are establishing some kind of regulation for, for, for RDM, for, for management and, and, and sharing the data. Uh, so from, from, the, from this, this study, what, what should, if you can have uh, two or three lessons learned for national funders, what? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I didn't really think a lot about national funders um, because also FBF in Austria already does it. But one thing that would come to my mind is that um, really the, that you also have the possibility for support, you know, so that you, you don't say do the DMPs and then you let people alone with doing that. Um, so if it's a requirement to, for, to do DMPs, really to direct people 
to where they can find support, to maybe offer support, finance support. Um, so as to translate from German, to take the people a little bit by their hand, you know, mm -hmm. to guide them a little bit. Because for many people, this, uh, if they don't have EU projects, maybe on the national level, this might be completely new. And then they, they might sp have to spend a lot of time and effort, as I saw in my qualitative interviews, to educate themselves. Because before we had the template, you know, we were just saying at the beginning of Horizon, okay, you have to do a DMP. And that's it. <laughs> and this, of course, in the beginning, it was not enough. And then people really have to invest a lot of time and effort if they want to do it right. Or they just say, okay, here is some sort of document that I made up. But then, of course, during Horizon, we provided the template, and you know, there's a lot more uh, now. Uh, support also through open air than there was at the beginning. And uh, I feel this, this would be very important to, to provide them uh, not only with the requirement, but then also with the support mechanisms to, to help them do it. And of course, they also will always will appreciate if um, they also have some resources. So that was a little bit, I didn't ask it in this survey, but of course, people were a bit grumbling that, you know, they have the project budget. And they have to use part of this project budget for data management and data DMPs. So, of course, what they would really like is to get some extra money. Um, now, we couldn't do this in Horizon, um, but I think it would be very nice if somebody would do it if, if there is money available. And I think maybe this already connects to the next presentation, which is about, uh, I think, costs or something. Yeah. Just, just one more question. Uh, taking the opportunity that you are here, the, all uh, your expertise. I think it's great when you you act as a as a project officer for doing the commission in the past, and you in fact were following projects that give a gave an important contribution for the policy, the RDM policy that we have currently, and but based on also your expertise. Um, so uh, one thing that uh, uh, that I think will make the difference in the in the future is if. Um, it's about individual grants or PhD projects to, uh, in fact, deliver, prepare a data management plan. So what is your reaction about this? So this is something that I am insisting in Portugal since a while, also for the universities and for the individual grants of FCT. FCT, our national funder, have project grants and individual grants. Uh, and, and for the individual grants, I, I, I am in favor that they should uh, ask for a DMP, because usually we are talking about young researchers. So what is your opinion about this? Uh, funder also yes, ask I for a DMP for individual grants or for a PhD? I think it's a, it's a good idea. And uh, certainly in, um, in the ERC, it's already uh, something that uh, people have to do. So I didn't really look and the collection doesn't really contain ERC templates because uh, by data management plans, because of these formal reasons that it's not a deliverable, and since it's not a deliverable, they don't have to say if it's public. And so since we did not have a very clear statement, these are public, we were a bit conservative, you know, just didn't put it online. But I do have an email from the EOC person saying you could put them online. So it would definitely be interesting to go to Cordis and, you know, download again only EOC templates, EOC data management plans, and see what they write. But so certainly within the EOC, it's already a requirement um, I think it's a little bit with the funding for Marie Curie. Uh, uh, it's a bit um, uh, it's a bit unclear whether you know you can use Marie Curie funding also to do a, D a DMP. Um, so I didn't see many of those. But so so those two schemes, right, Marie Curie and uh, Marie Swodowska Curie and the ERC, those would be the individual schemes at the EU level. And certainly for the ERC, you already have to do it. So. Whether they are good or not, I can't say because I didn't look at them and we didn't have a project from the ERC among the six projects, but they are already a requirement at the ERC level. Um, I also know in Berlin at the Charité where I was a couple of times now, um, with, they, they have an um, open innovation program and uh, I think their PhD students also have to do um, a DMP. So this would be a national uh, Mm -hmm. found out uh, at the Charité. So I definitely think it could also be something that uh, can be applied for a PhD uh, research. 
because what we should be aiming for, I think, um, is that good research data management is part of good research. So it's an integral part of, of doing good research is managing your research data, mm -hmm. making sure that it's curated and preserved. And uh, if we already include this in the, in the PhD uh, education, I think for many people, it will then become the norm rather than something that they didn't do and now they have to learn how to do it. If it's already included, especially in the training for when you, when you do your PhD, then I think then it will become something natural. And uh, that's what I think we should aim for, for the next generation of researchers. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I think we, we don't have more questions by now. So many thanks, Daniel, again, for our presentation. Thank you very much. I think I will, I will stay for the next presentation and then I yes. leave, but if there are more questions, feel free to send me an email. Okay. Many thanks. Thank you. So, now, uh, agora teremos a apresentação de Ryan O'Connor, do Digital Correction Center, que nos vai falar da gestão de custos na gestão de dados de, de investigação. Good afternoon, Ryan. Um, you can start uh, sharing your screen. So, thank you, everybody. Thanks. Um, for introducing me, Andre, and thanks, Paolo, uh, Paola and Pedro, for um, giving me the chance to speak to you guys today. So I'm just going to move my screen slightly. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just speak to you briefly today about the open air costings tool, and more specifically about the, um, the infographic that we developed, um, my colleagues and I at the DCC developed um, last year to sort of um, to complement this and to, to put a, some, give something a bit more user friendly and a bit more um, uh, just to help, help get people into the idea of uh, using the costing tool. So we'll just look ahead to what we're going to look at briefly today. So I'll give you an introduction to the and, and a background to the, the cost infographic that we developed. Um, we'll also look at how this um, ties into the open air costing tool that I just mentioned. Um, we'll look a bit in a bit more detail then at the three different sections of the um, infographic that we developed. Uh, and also then uh, we recently um, worked on um, a, just an editable version of this, which will allow people to, um, to sort of up to include their specific um, requirements and cost drivers and that kind of thing um, in the infographic. And hopefully we'll have a bit of time for um, some questions at the end. But um, before we get started, I'll just give a brief um, introduction to the DCC where I work. Um, so I'm, um, I'm working at the Digital Curation Center as a research data specialist. Um, so the DCC was established back in 2004, um, and they, it's been in, has has a number of different uh, formations since then. But uh, currently, it's a consortium based at the University of Edinburgh, where I'm based um, myself, and at the University of Glasgow as well. Um, so we work at, at UK national level and also across a, a lot of various different um, international levels. Um, involved in many different uh, international consortia. For instance, uh, we're heavily involved in the RDA Secretariat um, projects as well, like Open Air Advance, which is uh, ending in the next seven days, I think, um, as well as Fair is Fair and Fair for Health, another two big European projects we're involved in. Um, also run a lot of events such as IDCC, uh, International Data Conference, uh, the Julie Curation Conference, which is uh, taking place in April. Um, and involved in a lot of schools as well, including the CoData RDA um, Data Science Summer School. Um, we also run the DMP uh, online tool for data management plans. Um, I know we've covered DMPs a lot already today, but it's worth mentioning that. So generally, we can specialize in anything to, anything to do with RDM training around um, RDM consultancy and, and, uh, and uh, digital asset curation around policy making and policy analysis and generally just advocacy in digital data management, best practice and services provision. Um, one thing I'll just flag up though, we don't, we, we aren't a repository or we don't curate any data ourselves, rather we just um, use our um, knowledge and experience and expertise to help people deal with their data um, as best we can. So yeah, you'll see on screen here, the DOI for the infographic, which I mentioned already, um, that will be at, that DOI will be on screen on the next couple of slides. So you don't have to rush to, um, to memorize the numbers now. And I'll, I'll put the link in after the presentation as well. 
so the infographic itself is quite um quite a long document um but so i split it up into three different it's three different sections just to fit it easy on screen um and i'll go through the different sections uh one by one in a few minutes um first though just to give some background of this work so the infographic was developed as part of um our as part of the open air advance um, research data management task force um, the original idea, idea for it came from sort of informal discussions with other members of the task force, some of whom are researchers and some of whom are involved in research support at their universities. Um, so these discussions sort of identified the need for something a bit more um, high level to help communicate with our researchers about RDM costs. So things to do with um, the aspects of research that need to be accounted for, at what stage of the project this ideal needs to be done, um, what is eligible and what's ineligible to be covered by Horizon 2020 grants, and where to get more information on these types of things, etc. Um, so yeah, so this work was taken up by myself and my colleagues at the DCC, um, Sarah Jones, who was now at uh, Geant in the Netherlands, and my uh, colleague Alexandra Velipalta. Uh, so we decided to create something uh, vi more visual to sort of complement the existing open air costings guide, which I'll explain in a bit more detail next. Um, so yeah, in developing this, as well as the discussions we had with our colleagues on the open air um, RDM task force, we also drew on material and discussions which, which took place at one of our events at the DCC's um, Research Data Management Forum event, which was back in September 2019, which feels like a very, very long time ago. Um, that event was on uh, cost and data management. Um, so I've included a tiny URL link on the screen there, which will take you to the DCC site where um, you'll be able to find the summary of the discussions um, that took place at the event and the pre presentation materials used on the day as well. Um, I should have mentioned as well, well I'll share my um, slides with, with Paula and I'm sure she'll be able to distribute them to everybody here if they want to um, follow up on any of the links I mentioned. Yeah, so our um, so our, our the infographic was designed to complement the the open or the the open, yeah, the open air RDM costings tool. Um, so this costings tool was a, an existing resource developed by a previous um, open air project to help researchers and research uh, support staff comply with um, Horizon twenty twenty um, and open da open research data pilot requirements. Um, so this, this uh, costings tool is based on the UK data services data management costing tool and the work done in the Netherlands by the LCRDM on their guide for um, research data management, um, research data management and costs. Um, the links to both of these, those resources are available on the open air resource itself. Um, so yeah, taking the lead from these, the, the open air tool um, outlines different RDM activities and the potential costs associated with each, um, with the activities uh, ordered sort of by the phase of the project uh, life cycle, which, which these would typically occur. So for example, it highlights um, the activity of uh, potentially of, of transcription at this sort of data collection stage and the poten potential costs that might be associated with this. Also things like file format conversion at the data preservation archiving, and its potential costs. And there's a whole host of, um, I can't remember how many, but there must be about, about 20 different um, activities that would be, that could incur some sort of cost. Um, so the, this tool can be found quite easily on the open air site. So if you go on to openair.eu on the main page, if you just hover over um, support and then select guides, and it's one of the uh, guides that is uh, made available there. So yeah, now we can look at a little bit more closely at the infographic itself and the, um, the areas that we, we covered in it. Um, so the first section is the what to cost in section, um, sketches out the sort of infrastructure and skills costs. Another way we could, we're toying with um, maybe describing these will be to things like hard and soft costs um, with the former more to do with sort of hardware, hardware capabilities or things usually provided by a researcher's um, institute or by a third party, so the service provider for instance, uh, a repository, um, while the latter is more to do with sort of human capabilities and knowledge and expertise around that. There's obviously a lot of kind of uh, potentially a lot of overlap between these two different types of costs, but we thought it would be just good to have the first thing on the on the infographic to just get people familiar with these different to, to two broad generalizations of, uh, of costs. Um, so yeah, we've also highlighted the importance of um, the creation of a DMP, which which was covered, being covered obviously uh, by the our first two presenters today. Um, we thought this was uh, important for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, due to obviously the importance of 
DMP submission as part of um, Horizon 2020 funding applications for most applications, obviously, as, as um, Daniel mentioned, where people, some people might be able to opt out of this. Um, secondly, as, as it's mentioned in the, um, in the Horizon 2020 costing guide, um, their direct costs are covered uh, as long as they've been encouraged during the lifespan of a project. So in this sense, a DMP is, is really vital for addressing a project's needs um, in advance where possible. And considering this, being able to sort of consider the specific costs, specific costs that may be associated with these needs um, down the line, be able to account for these uh, as best you can. Um, so this section also has a brief introduction to this, the idea of the eligible and, and uh, ineligible costs under the Horizon 2020 grants, under the things to consider uh, box there in the middle. Um, so, and as well as the open air costing guide, there are links to a few others at the end of this section. So obviously the open air costing guide, there's the um, LCRDM and the UK data service and the Horizon 2020 costing guide. So in the next section, um, this is a bit more general, this kind of simply outlines this, uh, who can help you to estimate costs, um, simply so it outlines the various stakeholders who may be in a position to assist researchers to understand uh, and to estimate the costs associated or potentially associated as well with their uh, with their projects, so it's quite um, it's quite general in focus. And not every obviously not every stakeholder will be of relevance for every researcher or for every project. Um, for example, an um, institution may not have a dedicated data steward uh, who may who can be approached for advice. But however, the, um, the general idea with this was to show that there are many areas where researchers can seek advice. Um, and I'll try to show that these are all sort of connected in some way. And so it might be helpful to sort of imagine having a researcher in the, in the center of the circle there, but we didn't include that uh, icon in the, in the final version. So the next section, the final section, this was how much could management and de deposit cost? Um, so this section was a bit trickier to, to formulate. Um, so the, we've flagged up a few uh, example factors um, here again, um, and these will not apply to all researchers, obviously, but the costs associated with these three types of um, factors are some of the more common types of costs that researchers face. So things around the um, sensitivity of potential, or the security of potentially sensitive data, issues to do with data set size and the length of uh, preser preservation required. So in identifying some example costs for repository storage, um, we looked at the University of Cambridge repository and the Dryad um, data repository. Um, we, did, we had debated whether or not to include any specific costs here um, at all, as these things will obviously likely change over time, whether that's to do with um, uh, uh, changes to a, a repository's pricing structure or something as simple as um, changes in currency rates, obviously would have, would have a, a big effect. Um, but on balance, we sort of decided that it would be good to uh, include something here to put maybe just even just a general figure in front of researchers, um, even if in this case, even if it's an, an example one, just to get people thinking about the potential costs of um, various aspects of their um, RDM. So yeah, finally, um, we look at a more recent sort of application of this, so of the resource. So as I said, it was about, I think it must have been about a year ago, maybe probably a little bit more that we developed the, the infographic in the first place. Um, but recently, uh, so we uh, when we originally developed it, it was just like a static, uh, uneditable document that could be used to sort of introduce researchers to uh, the main RDM cost drivers and different types of costs and things that I um, already outlined. But recently, as part of a um, train the trainer workshop for the social science, social sciences and humanities open cloud, uh, my colleagues here at the DCC and I um, we reworked the infographic slightly to allow sections of it to be uh, editable. So this was part of a larger session, this um, shock session um, that focused on the cost of making data fair, where, um, which we, we were participating in on as part of the, our, the DCC's work on the um, Fair is Fair project. So we changed three of the sections to allow them to be editable. So there I've tried to display them on the right hand side here. So the three sections are the infrastructure and skills costs that I outlined already. The, um, the stakeholders the, um, in the who can help you estimate cost section and the, um, the main sort of, uh, some of the factors and drivers that affect RDM costs. So you can use the um, open air costings tool and users can identify their particular costs or those that are likely to be incurred at their institution and use these costs to fill out the sort of editable versions of um, 
editable sections with different costs and activities or example stakeholders or their cost drivers that are a bit more um, a bit more relevant in their um, in their context. Um, so this editable version is available with the um, using that um, the DOI at the bottom of the page there you can download it from so that takes you to the Zenodo link where you can download the original PDF or the editable um, version which is in a, a docx format so essentially word doc um, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more temperamental in a word doc format but it is um it is I think it is something worth the from the feedback we got at the uh, shock workshop um it was definitely something that people were um happy to have and they, they would seem to get a bit of use out of it even in the in the brief se um, sessions that we ran on this um so i think yeah so that is at the end of my um my presentation today so as i said my contact details are there on the screen um and uh, there's all, if you have any more, more general questions about the work that the DCC does, um, you can use the info at dcc.co.uk um, um, uh, email address and you get in touch with us through that way as well. So I'll just, I'll just see if I can get the Zoom thing back on screen. I don't know if there are any questions so far. Thanks, Ryan. Yes, for now, we, we don't have questions in the chat. If someone wants to, to ask something, Please. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay on to the um, to the end of the session today. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please please just ask and f and feel free to download the uh, the infographic in either format and you can disseminate it or just. Pr I'm hoping to see it someday that I will walk into some university somewhere that people will have it printed out and on the wall <laughs> as a surprise. But hope maybe that's wishing too much at the stage. But um, yeah, please just fire the questions into the chat and I'll hopefully be able to, to answer. Uh, I'll, shop, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Whether you want to make some question, I, I see you have opened your microphone. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. just a quick question, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan. If you based it on also this recent experience with uh, with uh, with shock, the, mm -hmm. the the training that you you mentioned, yeah. or, or your e expertise. So, um, and I think it, it's quite useful for the the type of um, of participants that we have here uh, with us today, um, researchers and. Um, and the, and the research support staff. So, um, uh, what uh, is your um, uh, main concern or, or, or the, the, the main difficulties that you that you find related with the uh, eligible when when someone is preparing a proposal, uh, they need to think about eligible. They need to have information about eligible costs from funders. Uh, they need to predict some costs for 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 RDM in order to 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 prepare their budget, mm. but then uh, there is the reality when the project starts. So, do, do you have any um, any input about this? Uh, so, what are the main problems, issues that a, a researcher need to solve a project, a PI need to solve between this uh, this preparation of the budget? Uh, yeah related with the eligible costs and then the reality when they start to, to in fact to, to when they realize that the type of data sets they need to 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 collect these kind of things they they start to have problems <laughs> and so do you have any 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 remark that you want to share with us yeah so that's that's a good question it's a, obviously that will kind of i think that would tie in a bit with um what ellie mentioned as well about the the dmp document itself being a living document so obviously that would ideally that would be updated as new um as the project progresses with whatever new um issues that the project encounters in terms of how that ties into costs um i guess it would be a similar sort of um a similar approach so obviously you have your initial budgeting um where you would try to foresee the the any sort of costs that you you might be uh, that you might encounter throughout the project but obviously that will change um i'm not too sure yeah i'm not too sure in terms of how you could um address this other than um maybe sort of mapping out or having um a sort of schedule uh, in advance where obviously if you use this as, like the open air costings tool or the uk data service or whichever costings tool you use maybe if you could have a, a sort of schedule throughout so maybe in the first six months if it's a i don't say it's a five-year project first six months after a year after two years that you would um refresh that almost and sort of put in your um your new uh your 
new activities or you, the new aspects that you're encountering, and then you build to revise your costs. Because I think, yeah, the main thing is to, between, as just going back to what you were saying first about the eligible and ineligible, the main thing is as long as you do it within the, the under the horizon 2020, as long as they're accounted for within the project lifespan, because it is a lot more difficult to obviously end, end the project and then find new costs that you have to go retroactively back and, and uh, sort of try and account for. Whereas if you have a take, take a more scheduled approach to, to addressing the costs as and as the project progresses in parallel to, to updating the DMP, I think that would be a really useful approach. Thank you, Ryan. Thank we, you, have, you. we have uh, a question in the chat. Yeah. Do you have any concrete issues that should be considered in these costs? Um, concrete issues in, in terms of um, like concrete examples or? Maybe predicting the costs, mm -hmm. or, for example. Yeah. Could you please uh, specify, Anna, if, if you have uh, any specific issue? Maybe I, I could just yes, please. speak. Yeah. It would be easier, I think, than writing. Uh, hello. Um, hello. I just, I, I didn't understand very well what costs should be considered in this because uh, we are speaking about uh, the uh, different platforms where that uh, researchers can use freely without paying, mm -hmm. or even uh, we can use the institutional repositories that uh, uh, those, of course, they have costs, but not for the researchers. So what, what, main, what main issues should be considered when we do a plan like this, what costs uh, should we consider the, the costs related to public, to, to the publications? Uh, they are connected in this kind of uh, information with data. I'm sorry, I am not understanding very well what we should consider here because it's something new for me too. So I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. No, no, I think uh, I think I understand. Yeah, so uh, I think that was very that was one of the issues that we sort of ran into dealing with um, trying to do something a bit more um, general. In that, obviously, every different project will have very different needs. So you might be looking at something like a really data intensive project, where um, where where they'll be, uh, be generating a lot of data or using a lot of data, and obviously, the one of the main costs there will be in the, in the storage. So you could be talking about gigs and gigs and gigs of, of data that might need, um, that might essentially cost a lot to store long term. Um, whereas it, obviously some other projects would be less data intensive. So it will very much depend um, on the individual projects. Um, again, I, I would refer back to, to, to using those the costings tools um, that we sort of refer to uh, uh, referred to earlier and that we took provide links to in the infographic and that they will be able to take um, researchers or um, PIs through each individual cost and you'll be able to address whether or not that will, that will apply to you. So it will, it will be a case of maybe just identifying costs that might be particular to you and in, uh, in some cases it might be the case that it's just a matter of ruling out costs and saying no this, this won't be a cost for me my, my project doesn't um, require um, transcription services, for instance, so that, that I can rule that cost out. But my, my project might potentially require um, uh, the file format to be converted, even though I'm, I'm to, for it to be preserved long, for long term. So I might be working with a, a certain file format during the project, but in the interests of making it as um, fair as possible, it might require a conversion at the, quite close to the end. So that could be a potential cost that might be, um, might be flagged up using those tools. But again, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's one of the issues, it, it's hard to sort of identify costs that will absolutely apply to every project, no matter what. So it will be a cost, it will be a case of trying to um, address on, on a project by project basis. Thank you. I hope that helps. Thank you, Ryan. I think we don't have more questions. So um, now we will, we will proceed with 
two presentations in Portuguese. So you can continue with us if you want. And if someone wants to put uh, some additional questions in the chat, um, please uh, go to the chat and you can answer direct directly. Uh, so, eu vou agora fazer a apresentação em inglês, na, aliás em português, nós agora vamos ter a apresentação uh, da colega Natália Botica, da, da Unidade de Arqueologia da Universidade do Minho, que nos vai falar das diretrizes partenos para a aplicação dos princípios FAIR à gestão e reutilização de dados. Portanto, Natália poderá começar a fazer partilha de sua ecrã. Já está a iniciar a partilha, já conseguimos ver perfeitamente. Boa tarde a todos. Obrigado. Muito obrigada por este convite e oportunidade de partilhar um pouco a nossa experiência aqui na arqueologia com, com, com os dados, os dados, nomeadamente dados FER. Em termos de desafios, a arqueologia tem imensos desafios, o processo arqueológico... Uh, faz com que tenhamos que lidar com uma diversidade imensa de, de dados, de tipo de, de dados e de formatos, uh, desde as escavações arqueológicas até ao processamento dos dados dessas escavações. Este era o nosso repositório de dados antes de, até os anos 90. Uh, rapidamente transitamos para uh, dados, alguns deles já nascidos em, em formato digital, mas muito dispersos em fecheiros de texto, em folhas Excel, em, em bases de dados access, etc. Portanto, tínhamos um, aqui um problema que era como gerir estes dados todos, que são uma grande quantidade de dados, que estão dispersos por vários for, formatos, fecheiros e também sujeitos à obsolescência, porque muitos dos suportes foram sendo descontinuados e os formatos também. Portanto, tínhamos nos anos 90, eh, tínhamos um problema que era, por um lado, eh, eh, salvaguardar os dados, eh, porque o, o processo arqueológico eh, tem ações irrepetíveis, não podemos voltar a escavar no mesmo sítio arqueológico, portanto há dados que se se perderem estão irremediavelmente perdidos para sempre, e como é que nós pegamos nesta diversidade de dados e formatos e integramos a informação, porque cada peça de, de, do dado arqueológico só faz sentido se estiver integrado num, num contexto como um todo. Portanto, temos os dados base que são, que são resultantes de, do processo de sondagens, escavações arqueológicas, temos dados que resultam do processamento uh, desses dados já em gabinete uh, e uh, temos então um problema ainda que tínhamos no formato em papel, mas continuamos também no formato digital, que são conjuntos de dados muito dispersos e uh, que, em termos globais do país e internacional, são dificilmente localizáveis e acessíveis, porque continuam ou nos computadores dos investigadores ou no computador institucional. Portanto, a nossa primeira preocupação, e até uh, aos anos 2000, 2000 e pouco, foi vamos trabalhar internamente, fiz, desenhamos o nosso sistema de, de informação, desenhamos já um esquema de dados e, e fomos acrescentando também os metadados importantes, desenvolvemos uma aplicação de back-office para registro de dados, para que todos os dados, independentemente do investigador, do arqueólogo que estava a recolher, fossem dados que tivessem sistematizados, que determinados atributos eram mandatórios e era obrigatório o seu registro, para normalizarmos os dados, para termos já vocabulários controlados, porque não podemos comparar coisas que se, se usamos vocabulários diferentes, não podemos na altura comparar coisas se usamos vocabulários diferentes para o mesmo conceito e integrar, integrar todos estes dados. Portanto, esta foi a nossa preocupação e desenvolvemos toda a nossa atividade interna da unidade de arqueologia no sentido de um, integrar os dados, uh, preservá-los e poder geri los uh, para uh, ajudar nas interpretações arqueológicas. A partir de determinado ponto temos aquilo que nos levou aqui que é a partilha de dados. O processo arqueológico vive 
não só da escavação, mas depois da interpretação e uh, melhores interpretações estão suportadas em melhores dados, não só dos dados que nós encontramos nas nossas escavações, mas daqueles que precisamos uh, de, de outros uh, sítios arqueológicos e de estudos já realizados. Portanto, para dar esse passo na partilha dos nossos dados e também reutilizar uh, quer os nossos, quer dados que, 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 que nos fazem falta, Uh, então demos o outro passo que é exportar os nossos dados e metadados e colocá-los no repositório, que no caso o Data Repositório UM, onde temos já conjuntos de dados de, de escavações arqueológicas, nomeadamente este que temos aqui, uh, de um exemplo de um tesouro monetário que foi encontrado no sítio arqueológico e, e que nós uh, aí depositamos e temos uh, partilhado no nosso repositório. No entanto, ainda temos um passo, portanto temos trabalhado para conseguir uh, ter fair data, temos uh, este trabalho para partilhar os nossos conjuntos de dados, mas nós precisamos muito também de, de, de outros dados. E então estamos envolvidos também num, uh, em projetos uh, onde a reutilização dos dados arqueológicos a nível nacional e internacional esteja em cima da mesa uh, e o que é que precisamos de fazer para uh, aumentar a reutilização dos dados. Uh, temos um, um trabalho ainda para fazer e que estamos também a fazer que é uh, ter uh, link de data Uh, vai permitir a uh, uh, interoperabilidade entre vários repositórios e vai permitir que a reutilização dos dados uh, seja mais fácil possível uh, e, e alargada. Portanto, esse, este é o passo onde estamos a trabalhar. Participamos uh, como Associated Partners no Ariadne Plus, que é um projeto que começou com o Ariadne que agora uh, está a ser continuado, que é uma infraestrutura de dados arqueológicos uh, uh, a nível mundial. Uh, nós vamos aí também partilhar os nossos dados, no entanto o Ariadne uh, percebeu que partilha dados de repositórios, mas que há dois ou três países apenas na Europa que têm repositórios de dados arqueológicos, a maior parte dos dados continua a ser trabalhado individualmente pelos investigadores e a ser guardado em vários formatos, nem sempre com vocabulários controlados e que dificulta bastante a nossa partilha de, de dados com esta plataforma internacional. Participamos também no projeto Parthenons, apenas uma... uma digamos que, que muito restrita, mas que achamos que, que este projeto eh, tem esta preocupação do, do Fair Data, tem um guia muito bem elaborado com as diretrizes para a aplicação dos princípios Fair e que, e que eh, participamos apenas na, na, na tradução destes princípios, dada a sua organização e clareza da informação que, que prestava, para trazer aqui também e disponibilizar aos nossos investigadores e divulgar um, estas diretrizes que nos pareceram importantes. O Partenon está também muito ligado ao projeto uh, SEADA. Este projeto SEADA apareceu precisamente porque temos, temos a ideia de um repositório, uma infraestrutura internacional para agregar vários dados arqueológicos, no entanto temos dificuldade nessa agregação porque há poucos repositórios uh, de dados com, com dados FED e uh, é preciso trabalhar na uh, uh, recolha de informações para uh, conseguir uh, ter dados fair, ter vocabulários controlados, apoiar um entendimento de práticas a nível internacional para a, a, a disseminação e reutilização dos dados arqueológicos uh, e, e, portanto, este, estes três projetos, digamos, que estão a tentar estabelecer entendimentos e, e princípios comuns para ajudar a que possamos ter de facto uma partilha de dados e a possibilidade de os reutilizar 
que na, que na maior parte das áreas de investigação é muito importante e na arqueologia, eh, a arqueologia não é exceção e é fundamental para aumentar a nossa capacidade de fazer interpretação, de fazer estudos mais abrangentes eh, nas, nas várias vertentes da, da arqueologia. E, portanto, era, era esta experiência que eu queria eh, partilhar e estou disponível para... Eh, para responder a alguma questão que, que possam querer colocar. Muito obrigado, Natália, pela sua apresentação. Alguém quer ou gostaria de colocar alguma questão, algum esclarecimento? Por favor, pode escrever no chat ou então abrir o microfone. Se não, entretanto, eu também poderei fazer uma questão à Natália, no que diz respeito aos princípios FAIR. Por exemplo, se, se consegue identificar uh, as principais dificuldades que, que podem decorrer da implementação destes princípios uh, de dados que são gerados na, na arqueologia, que por norma nós quando pensamos em dados não nos vem à cabeça, não é de imediato, dados gerados pela investigação na área da arqueologia, pensamos noutras áreas. Então, nesta área, quais é que serão assim, os principais desafios? Um, os, o, 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 temos aqui vários desafios, não é? Primeiro que na arqueologia temos alguns, algumas diretrizes regulamentares relativamente à partilha de dados. Portanto, o, o arqueólogo que escava um sítio arqueológico tem normalmente reserva de, sobre os dados de X anos, portanto temos a obrigação de partilhar os relatórios finais de escavação, mas não de partilhar os dados. E, os dados têm a ver com a descrição do, do sítio, das unidades estratigráficas, dos materiais que lá são encontrados e que o arqueólogo tem a reserva durante X anos, suponho que agora no estado atual são, são três, em que os, os dados são, podem ser guardados para si, eh, para, para poderem ser estudados e publicados mais tarde. Portanto, desde logo há aqui um, uma reserva que faz com que durante um período de tempo grande nós não temos acesso, podemos não ter acesso a esses dados e normalmente não, normalmente não temos. Depois temos um outro grande problema que tem a ver com Uh, os vocabulários controlados, portanto uh, partimos de um estado em que cada um uh, caracterizava as unidades estratigráficas e, uh, e os materiais com, com uh, texto livre e portanto uh, usavam os termos que, 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 que normalmente uh, estavam habituados a usar e não havia de facto uma uniformização de, de, do, dos vocabulários usados para descrever o mesmo, o mesmo conteúdo e portanto tínhamos aqui um grande problema quando nós queríamos cruzar dados com dados de outras escavações que era muitas vezes usavam até eh, tínhamos códigos onde não tínhamos a correspondência de, de que é que esse código eh, queria, queria dizer e portanto Tínhamos aqui um segundo nível de, que dificultava a, a partilha e, o cruza, e a reutilização de dados uh, arqueológicos. E, portanto, aqui o projeto SEADA está uh, uh, a fazer um trabalho muito interessante com comunidades muito alargadas, são 23 países que fazem parte do projeto uh, e mais uns parceiros para que se consiga um entendimento relativamente a que atributos é que nós devemos registar, uh, ter vocabulários controlados, uh, que, que na arqueologia tem também algumas outras questões, por exemplo, quando nós usamos cronologias, a Idade Média em Portugal não, não, não vai, vai do ano A a B, que não é o mesmo período que acontece na Idade Média, uh, não é? que, que em França, onde tem um, um tempo, é balizado por um outro tempo, Uh, aí o projeto Ariadne também tem uma, um, desenvolveu uma aplicação que se chama o período para que cada um, termo que é usado na cronologia tenha uma correspondência direta com o um ano de início e de fim, porque é muito diferente ou pode ser muito diferente de país para país. Portanto, temos uma série de particularidades na arqueologia 
que até agora tem, de facto, nós vemos o Ariadne que é uma grande infraestrutura, tem um grande potencial, mas pouquíssimos dados nós lá temos. Porquê? Precisamente porque o mapeamento das... Como, primeiro, não, os dados não são colocados em repositórios, só dois ou três países é que têm repositórios de dados arqueológicos. Portanto, cada um tem as suas fichas, Uh, com os seus templates ou os atributos que quer pôr e portanto mapear isto com uma infraestrutura que serve de uh, dados arqueológicos de todos os países é, tem de facto sido uma dificuldade uh, porque esse trabalho tem que ser feito, ou seja, a comunidade de arqueologia tem que discutir quais são os atributos para cada tipo de registro, tem que discutir os vocabulários que, que, que usa. Há um, há um trabalho muito grande a fazer até nós conseguirmos fazer um mapeamento simples e mais ou menos direto para ter acesso a, a, a datasets internacionais. Bem, temos uma, uma questão no chat da Laudalina que pergunta que destino final uh, tiveram os dados arqueológicos em papel. Eu penso que, que se deve referir à uhum. parte inicial da sua apresentação. Pois, uh, nós conseguimos, conseguimos continuamos a, a, a mantê-los, uh, bem como a, a, a Direção-Geral, que é responsável por manter uh, uh, o espólio, uh, a verdade é que nós uh, vamos fazendo, porque felizmente somos uma universidade, e temos algumas teses de mestrado e doutoramento que eh, vamos eh, desde os anos 2000 que os nossos dados são nativamente digitais, ou seja, são introduzidos diretamente no back office, eh, os dados de, de registro alfanumérico, as imagens, os desenhos, tudo isso eh, já nascem em formato digital e é introduzido no back office e vamos sempre fazendo trabalho para trás, ou seja nas escavações onde nós tínhamos ainda os cadernos de campo e tudo em papel, como temos felizmente muitos trabalhos de investigação que usam esses dados, portanto vamos recuperando e temos já muitos dados recuperados que estavam em papel e que nós já incluímos no nosso sistema de informação. É evidente que quando se trata de empresas de, de arqueologia individual, o que, o que nós temos é na na Direção-Geral do Património, uh, o, os sucessos em papel e, portanto, o, o acesso é local e quem quiser reutilizar esses dados tem que os registrar, ou seja, tem que ir consultar os cadernos de campo e tem que passá-los para, um, para um formato digital, caso contrário, a sua reutilização é, não é possível. Eu gostava de fazer uma pergunta, não sei se posso, se ainda tenho Sim, tempo. Sempre por favor. Primeiro gostava de lhe dar os parabéns, porque achei super interessante a apresentação e fazer-nos pensar estes dados os olhados do ponto de vista da arqueologia. Eu faço investigação em psicologia com famílias adotivas e estava a pensar se este guia da aplicação dos princípios FAIR Uh, que falou que tinha sido desenvolvido no âmbito do projeto Partenon, se acha que é suscetível de ser aplicado para uma realidade tão diferente em que a maior parte das variáveis com que eu trabalho, os dados, são considerados dados pessoais e, portanto, que estão, uh, enfim, uh, sob uma grande vigilância do RGPD uh, e, e que exigem cuidados acrescidos em termos da proteção uh, dos dados e se acha que uh, recorrer, eu tenho tido alguma dificuldade em gerir esta abertura, não é? a abertura que é desejável e uh, as open as uh, possible, as close as necessary, portanto gerir um bocadinho esta máxima quando os dados são tão sensíveis quanto podem ser estes que dizem respeito à vida privada das pessoas e à sua história de vida, como acontece na adoção. Você acha que pode ser uma ajuda? E eu consultar este seu guia. 
este, este guia resultou de, de que são pontos importantes que têm várias características, não é? Uma, ela, uma desde logo tem a ver com os conjuntos de dados, autoria, quando é que foram registados, quando não foram, que, que se aplica, que é transversal e com certeza na sua área também é, é importante. Outra tem a ver com um, aquilo que, ou seja, no fundo o que nos traz aqui, o que nos trouxe a este ponto, tem tudo a ver com a, a possibilidade de outros poderem reutilizar os dados. Outros ou nós próprios, por exemplo, na arqueologia, a arqueologia tem um processo que é de escavação, que começa e acaba ali, é irrepetível, mas depois tem um grande processo de interpretação. E a interpretação é à luz daquilo que a gente sabe no momento e à luz das ferramentas que nós temos no momento. E, portanto, aquilo, uma interpretação que é feita para um sítio pode mais tarde ser revista porque temos outras ferramentas a aplicar aos dados ou porque juntamos outra informação. E, e com certeza, no seu trabalho também, eh, também é importante. Eh, nós temos, por exemplo, uma dificuldade e que estamos a trabalhar na, na inteligência artificial e, e, e na descoberta de conhecimento uh, através dos dados, a dificuldade que tem na arqueologia tem a ver com aquilo que eu falei, que é nós temos que juntar vários conjuntos de dados, mas não podemos juntar alhos com, com bocalhos, ou seja, esses conjuntos de dados devem obedecer a, a princípios uh, fair, ou seja, nós temos que definir, mapear quais são os dados e o que é que lá estão dentro dos dados e que terminologias é que nós uh, usamos para conseguir estudar, quer cruzar dados, quer na arqueologia, quer na sua área. Portanto, é isso que calhar alguém tem que fazer o trabalho, que é o que é que é identificativo do, do, da, da pessoa e que não interessa quando está a pensar em cruzar dados, uh, interessa se calhar associar dados com... Uh, não é? com, com outros campos ou não, mas quais são os campos que eu posso partilhar e que não identificam a, a pessoa e, e isso que eu posso partilhar e que eu preciso também de feedback, preciso também de, de, de olhar para outros dados e ver se há padrões que são iguais, se são diferentes e, e, e portanto fazer esse trabalho parece-me possível e, e interessante e essas diretrizes também podem apoiar aí, ou seja, de poder publicar os seus conjuntos de dados, tem um autor, tem uma data em que foi recolhida, tem uh, uma série de informações que podem estar associadas, mas que não identificam uh, pessoas nem, nem, e, e que permite cruzar depois e fazer estudos mais abrangentes para tentar uh, reconhecer padrões, uh, aplicar ferramentas aos dados Uh, um, para, para, para conseguir saber mais, no fundo é o que nós procuramos é pegar nos nossos dados e cruzar com outros para sabermos mais, para conseguirmos uh, ir mais longe no nosso conhecimento Muito bem <risos> Obrigado Natália pela, pelas suas respostas bastante completas foi, foi, foi muito interessante a sua apresentação obrigado pela, pela partilha Vamos, penso que não temos mais questões, também o tempo já, já vai um pouco para além da hora, por isso vamos continuar com, com a nossa sessão. Pronto, mais uma vez obrigado Natália. Uh, vamos prosseguir com a, a nossa última apresentação, que irá ser feita pela, pela nossa colega Paula Moura, da Universidade do Minho, uh, que trabalha também no, no Gabinete de Gestão de Informação Científica, Repositórios e Ciência Aberta e que nos vai apresentar um conjunto de serviços que o OpenAid disponibiliza para apoiar o, os investigadores a gerir os seus dados. Portanto, passo a palavra à minha colega Paula. Paula, quando quiseres, podes começar. Obrigada, Andrei. Uh, olá, boa tarde uh, a todos. Eu vou ser uh, breve. Uh, queria só uh, fazer aqui uma... 
a apresentação uh, de alguns uh, serviços que, que o Open Air uh, disponibiliza e, uh, e depois também falar um pouco sobre os materiais de suporte uh, uh, que o Open Air, uh, tem para esta área da, da gestão dos dados. Um, falarei então sobre o Zenodo e o Amnésia, uh, sobre o Argos a minha colega Ellie da Tina Research Center já, já fez uma apresentação bastante extensa e, e, e muito clara para, para, para todos. Um, começando pelo Zenodo, uh, escusa de apresentações, porque penso que a maioria da, dos participantes aqui já, já tem conhecimento sobre esta plataforma, este repositório generalista para publicação e partilha de resultados de investigação, sejam publicações, dados ou software. Um, aqui tem as vantagens de, de, de fazer a atribuição de identificadores persistentes, bem como para a criação de, de comunidades, comunidades essas um, sejam associadas a projetos ou a áreas temáticas, como veremos mais à frente. Um, uma vez que tem uma API bastante robusta uh, de, de, de projetos de financiamento, seja da, da Comissão Europeia, seja da Wellcome Trust ou Research uh, Council, eu tenho todos os projetos, todas as, as entidades e as organizações uh, financiadoras estão aqui representadas, conseguimos sempre fazer uma identificação uh, do projeto afeto a, a, ao, ao dataset ou ao conjunto de dados uh, que estamos a, a, a partilhar. Um, da mesma forma, conseguimos também fazer a atribuição de licenças, de licenças de, de uso, com o uso da, das licenças da Creative Commons, mas também uh, um, identificar os direitos de acesso a, a, a esses mesmos dados, um, da mesma forma como fazemos para as publicações. Quanto a depósitos, um, permite sempre fazer um depósito por conjunto ou por conjunto por dataset até aos uh, 50 gigas. Aqui tem um exemplo de, 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 uma, de uma comunidade no, no Zenodo, uh, que, que foi uh, lançada inicialmente um projeto com o Open Air e a RDA, uh, que depois também lançou uma call para vários investigadores para auxiliarem na curadoria uh, dos dados e das publicações que foram sendo aqui uh, reunidos, mas também uma comunidade, neste caso, associada a um projeto. E então uh, conseguimos ver aqui do, do vosso lado direito a identificação da, da, do projeto associado e quais os, os objetivos que estão associados à criação uh, deste, desta comunidade. Uh, temos também um, o Amnésia. O Amnésia é uh, uma ferramenta para, uh, que permite, de alguma forma, a anonimização de, de dados, ou seja, a transformação de dados sensíveis, de dados pessoais, para dados uh, anónimos uh, e que de alguma forma vai garantir que esta anonimização uh, uh, poderá fazer, não, poderá não, uh, para não existir uma, uma relação com, com os dados originais. Isto aqui é que faz a distinção entre aquilo que, que, que se anonimização. O processo aqui é feito através do... Do, do recurso ao, a algoritmos, algoritmos que depois vão atuar sendo bases de dados relacionais ou bases de dados multirelacionais. Um, ao nível dos materiais da o, o Open alguns materiais mais registrados ao aberto, mas também uh, um, no respeito ao guias e, e aí atuando e fazendo uso da, da que, que o Open Air também tem uh, com os seus no e outros parceiros que também vão connosco uh, trabalhando um, nas que estão sendo desenvolvidas ao nível da gestão parte das políticas ou mesmo nas questões legais uh, também desenvolvemos uh, PACs frequentes direcionadas para determinadas áreas, assim como um serviço de LTEs, quer para estas questões de vais durante o chapéu da ciência aberta, como uh, também para relacionadas com os próprios exemplos ao nível do cumprimento uh, de requisitos e dos custos associados de algum destes dias, uh, como cumprir com as diretrizes e para a para, para, para investigação e identificar os seus como vimos aqui, a própria Ryan do DCC, ao nível dos formatos dos dados, 
exatamente com os princípios, os princípios de e mesmo ao nível de preservação, sua preservação no tempo, na criação de planos de gestão de dados, que já também conseguimos ir acompanhando aqui ao longo dos dias, e também algumas ferramentas para auxiliar na sua tarefa, como é o caso do Argos relativamente à propriedade intelectual e aos direitos de autor e fazendo mais uma vez uso desta grande rede e da especialização uh, nesta área legal, temos uma série de guias uh, muito bem elaborados uh, para, uh, que, nos, que nos auxiliam no melhor entendimento para o licenciamento de dados, licenças a usar, uh, reutilizados, como evitar e como tratar os próprios dados sensíveis. Uh, e ao nível do depósito de dados também, uh, guias específicos para identificar repositórios confiáveis uh, para o depósito dos novos dados. O resultado uh, encontra-se aqui, já vimos este infográfico hoje, apresentado pelo Ryan, que também foi fruto deste trabalho, destas task forces. Aqui um infográfico que nos dá uh, de forma interativa também com acesso aos links e está tudo disponível no portal do Open Air. Uh, o depósito dos dados no repositório de de, de preservação, ou então aqui mais recentemente uma página que foi também fruto de um tra do, do, do trabalho feito pela Task Force, uh, onde, se foi, onde foram reunidas um, uh, histórias e, e casos de uso uh, relativos à reutilização de dados. Aqui foram uh, uh, várias, várias uh, instituições que participaram, várias pessoas que participaram, uh, e também tem aqui não só estas histórias, mas também tem uh, webinars específicos, uh, mais uma vez dados por pessoas especializadas na área, que de alguma forma também vão explicando todas as questões legais associadas aqui à, à reutilização de, de dados. Uh, ultimamente uh, fez-se a atualização uh, de alguns recursos, como são estas folhas uh, de facto, ou as fact sheets, umas mais direcionadas para as questões dos, dos requisitos do H2020, e então temos aqui alguns exemplos, que é relacionado só pelo de dados, dados sensíveis, a uh, coordenadores de projetos e a, a, a investigadores, Uh, e outras mais direcionadas para um, os serviços que o Open Air tem vindo a desenvolver e que muitos, a maior parte deles já se encontram uh, uh, em fase de, de maturação, um, como é o caso do Amnésia, do Argos e uh, do Zenodo, que todos também já conhecem. São sempre uh, informações mais específicas, onde apontam sempre para uma mesma estrutura, o que é, uh, o, que é que, o que é que contempla, uh, quais são os benefícios na sua utilização e depois links de acesso e, e para mais informação e às vezes até para, para os próprios guias. E com isto termina então a apresentação. Muito obrigada. Se tiverem algumas dúvidas, estejam à vontade para nos contactar. Deixamos aqui os contactos de e-mail. E obrigada. Muito obrigado, Paula, pela tua apresentação. Penso que nos trouxeste aqui os recursos fundamentais do, para, do Open Air para, 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 para a comunidade. Se tiverem alguma questão, algum esclarecimento sobre alguns destes serviços, por favor coloquem as vossas questões. Temos uma questão da Elizabeth, perguntando se o amnésia pode ser usado por qualquer pessoa. Sim, eu esqueci de referir é, o facto, o Amnésia existe um, para experimentação e teste em função web, mas também pode ser um, usado localmente, ou no, num computador, uh, e, e, ou numa infraestrutura de uma organização. Idealmente será a, a melhor forma de utilização quando estamos a lidar com, com dados sensíveis. Mas para fazer testes uh, pode perfeitamente fazer a utilização do, do, do Argos no no contexto web. Muito bem, temos outra pergunta, da Inês Felícia. Tenho uma pergunta. Uh, os 50 GB de limite de carregamento no Zenodo referem-se apenas aos perfis pessoais, correto? Uma comunidade não tem limite? Não, quando falava nos 50 GB é por conjunto de dados, por dataset. Okay. Uma, uma comunidade vai reunindo uh, diferentes recursos e dif diferentes resultados uh, de, de diferentes conjuntos de dados, se, se, se estivermos só a falar de dados, um, e, uh, que podem ter no seu total N gigas, mas cada conjunto no depósito, no ato de depósito, uh, o, o limite será assim uh, 50, 50 gigas. Ok, obrigado Paula. Não sei se há mais questões, se tiverem por favor... Podem escrever no chat ou abram o microfone e podem colocar diretamente a vossa questão. Penso que não. Silêncio quer dizer que não haverá mais questões. 
Portanto, Paulo, uma vez mais obrigado pela, pela tua apresentação. Uh, uma, uma questão, uma afirmação da uh, Laudalina, não sei se compreendi bem a questão. Os webinars sobre reutilização de dados é interno ou está aberto a nível Não, não, geral? estão abertos. Uh, eu coloco já aqui o link onde estão a, a, as sessões dos webinars sobre, sobre reutilização de dados. Ok, obrigado Paula. Portanto, já vamos bastante para além da hora, por isso agradeço uma vez mais aos oradores, um, que nos trouxeram hoje contributos muito importantes. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you all uh, of the... Uh, thank you all, all, all speakers that have presented their experiences and knowledge with the, uh, our Portuguese community. So we will close the, this session. Obrigado a todos, o, a todos os participantes que se mantiveram aqui connosco ao longo desta sessão. Os materiais bem como a gravação, irão ser disponibilizados na página do evento. E apenas como dica, para amanhã nós iremos ter uma nova sessão, à mesma hora, pelas 14h30, e irá ser sobre a implementação de políticas de ciência aberta dos financiadores e nas instituições de, de investigação. Portanto, se tiverem interesse em conhecer mais sobre o, o que se está a desenvolver em torno das políticas de ciência aberta, por favor, juntem-se a nós amanhã na, na sessão pelas 14h30. Obrigado mais uma vez uh, e boa tarde.